Have you ever wondered, is it a wonderful life? Well, the answer is yes, but that's what we'll talk about today. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. And when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? Clarence the Angel. It's a wonderful life. Last year at this time, episode 67 and 68, I talked about Christmas movies and a New Year's movie. And we're going to continue that tradition by talking about the movie It's a Wonderful Life. For those of you who don't know, and you can tell why I'm going to like this movie, because it's an alternate time movie, just like Run, Lola, Run, or Sliding Doors, or some of the other movies we talked about in the recent weeks, is there's a good man named George Bailey, he comes across hard times, and he wished he was never born. And he's given a chance and an opportunity to see what the world would be like without him. But the story goes a lot deeper than that. The story goes over why this man, George Bailey, is a good man and why this other human being named Henry Potter is a bad man. And it's not this clear-cut thing. There's very nuanced ideas about why each of them have a different story. Of course, Henry Potter's a rich guy, but that's not why he's a bad man. He's a bad man because he will go through hook or crook to make what he wants to happen happen. He'll cheat people out of things. He had the opportunity to tell someone who lost $8,000 that he had the money. He found it. He didn't do that because it didn't help his purpose to do that. He also felt like he could go around keeping everyone under his thumb, basically dangling the good things of life just out of their reach so they could never have it. And while he has an entire town under his thumb, he can rule with an iron fist, do what he wants to do. And then lastly, when he doesn't get his way and he can't figure out another way of getting his way, he tries to pay people off. So George Bailey is the counter of this character. Here's the story of George Bailey. Good kid, saved his brother, he also saved the local pharmacist from making a terrible mistake. He could have just washed his hands of the whole situation. Oh, I don't know, it's complicated. The guy just smacked me because I tried to tell him the truth. I'm just out of here. But instead, he persisted because he knew what was the right thing to do. He helped his family. He was there to be with his family. And when it came down to it, he was given a choice. He was on the verge of leaving this town behind seeing the world, seeing great things in the world, and then going to college and building big things. Is it to say that any of those things are wrong? It's not. But you have to realize that when you say yes to something, you are saying no to other things. And in this case, by him saying yes to his dreams of world travel, he was saying no to a lot of things that in the end, he didn't really even know that he wanted. We talked about that the last podcast, about how you can't really even know your future self. You don't even know who you will want, the things that you will want, and how you get there. The big lesson here is that sometimes when you're a kid, you have these dreams. Ken, I wanted to be an astronaut. Or I did. I wanted to travel the world and see amazing things. I thought about the fact that maybe I would live different places, you know, spend a couple of years in this community and work as a librarian and then move to this other community and work as an office staff person and just have that nomadic life. I just wanted to see amazing things and meet amazing people. And to an extent, too, I live in a place I don't particularly like. I want to move up north. I want more snow, more cold, more woods. I love the forest more than anything. And so the obvious question is, when people find this out, is why don't you move? And it's because when I say yes to moving or yes to that nomadic life, I'm saying no to friends who are a family to me. They're the thing that matters to me in this town. And if I leave this town, I leave them. Growing up in the military, you leave places all the time. And your friends leave those places all the time. And so longstanding friendships didn't really happen that much. Through a lot of events that has to do with the savings alone that his father founded, he ends up staying in town. He ends up being in charge of the savings and loan out of obligation. He didn't want to do it. 
He wanted a different kind of life, but you know what? He ended up doing it and it was a burden to him. And you could see that he was looking at his lost dreams. But you know what? He ended up getting new dreams. He got his wife, Mary. He had three wonderful kids. He got this old creaky house that should have been leveled decades before. And he got a happy life. But the other part of it, too, is that he was happy. He enjoyed those things in his life. So while it's not the life he imagined for himself, it became important to him. Even in the end, that savings and loan became important to him. He mattered to the community, and that community mattered to him. As you can see him falling for Mary early on in the beginnings of the movie, you could tell that he's shy to reach out to her. He's wooing her, but he doesn't act on anything. And what's hilarious is at one point he asks, am I talking too much? And this neighbor who was kind of behind the bushes over there said, yes, why don't you go and kiss her? And then laments, ah, youth is wasted on the wrong people. And it made me laugh because when I watched the movie, and I almost watched it every year at Christmas time, what do you mean that youth is wasted on the wrong people? I don't even understand what you're saying. And what I realized is, that George is being shy, Mary's being shy, but the other thing is that you have to sometimes act. And that risk-taking, that knowledge of what you should do next, sure enough, comes along a little bit with age. And then you don't have the opportunities you did when you were younger, maybe more in mode to have relationships with other people, and you don't take those chances. So this is where he ended up not taking the chance but later on learned how important Mary was to him. And at the point then when Potter figures out he can't take the savings alone away from George, he was hoping George would leave and go away and he'd be able to take the savings and loan after his father, Peter Bailey, died. But you know what? After he realizes he can't take it, he calls him in and offers George Bailey everything George ever wanted, money, money to take care of his family, money to even take care of a larger family, except that old house, maybe live in a good house, and also get to travel. He was going to give him all those opportunities. I noticed, too, that when George Bailey was offered this job, it was a three-year contract. It would be worth three years of just giving George Bailey this money and these trips, letting him go after that, it doesn't really matter anymore, just to get this other savings and loan business out of his way. Probably be the cheapest decision he made all week. Potter's view, he was probably being charitable. But we all know he didn't care about anything charitable. And we don't see what that looks like until George Bailey decides he wants to kill himself. He doesn't want to be here anymore. He's worth more dead than alive, according to this insurance policy and according to Potter. Not true. But when he goes out to the bridge, the angel Clarence comes down, jumps in the water. So George, knowing George is a saver, goes out and saves him too. The problem is, is that when George basically explains that the world would be better off without me, Clarence, who's a pretty inexperienced angel, gives him that wish, shows him what happened to this town and all the people around him if he never existed. And suddenly you realize that not only did George keep this town from being completely owned by Potter, being renamed Potterville, having him own everything, every building, every major business, the only bank in town. Boy, there's a lesson in there about monopolies. But having a choice to make all the difference in that town. But then it goes back to he never saved his brother. Therefore, his brother never saved his fellow troops in World War II. He never got to marry. And amazingly, Mary ended up never marrying anybody, ended up having to wear glasses, too. I'm not sure how the glasses happened, but because George wasn't there, she wore glasses. Everyone in town was worse for it. The people didn't have homes. They didn't have the family stability a home helps with. And the town becomes crass. Everyone in the town becomes obnoxious. They've lost so much. There's drinking. It's not a fun bar where all the friends go to be with each other. It's dark. 
and people go there to get drunk. And the town itself is down on its morale. It doesn't even have any joy left in it. This is a town that exists without George. And to be honest, Potter's the same. He doesn't change. He doesn't realize he has everything he ever wanted in life, but instead owns everything in life and probably still wants more. He is an unchanging individual who will not lift anything to redeem himself, to change his life. And that, in the end, I think is the point of the movie, is that George doesn't see the impact he makes, how many lives he touches. And we don't see the lives that we touch or the impact that we make either. The interesting thing is, is we think about the big things. George wants to build buildings. He wants to build bridges. Those are the big things. Those are the things that matter the most. But instead, what matters is being a good neighbor, being a friend to people, helping them out when they need it, and being a rock of reliability and integrity in a world where there is no integrity or you don't see it around as much. You would have figured that if the movie was remade, you would see that George wants to live his true life. He wants to go out and be the digital nomad. And he's not going to be shamed into taking care of this town. He doesn't owe anything that town. You could almost see even a different kind of it's a wonderful life now. The important part becomes of community and sacrifice. And even if you end up never leaving your hometown, but you have made such a difference in everyone's life, it matters and it touches so many people. And that every life has purpose and every life gives impact to those around them. And you notice even in the movie, it's not even the impact of the people around you. It's around the people around you that are around them. So maybe you give someone a good word at the grocery store. That person goes home a little bit happier and treats their kids better. The kids go around and feel loved. Again, those things ripple throughout society. Our lives are not our lives, but they are the ripples that we make in our lives. Someone in Salon wrote a review of the movie and talked about the fact that George spent the whole movie looking at himself like Potter sees him, an ultimate failure, a guy who never got his goals, never worked hard to get the things he wanted, and instead giving out money to people who don't need it, probably can't pay it back, and shouldn't be involved in this. He said, too, that it was probably something Frank Capra saw in his own town, where things were this way he remembers growing up and becoming crass, becoming no longer the place he remembers. This last summer, I went up to a place called Christmas, Michigan. And as a kid, I had this image of Christmas, Michigan, where there were stores about Christmas. It was Christmas every day. There was ornaments. Strangely enough, I think there was a bear. But there were all sorts of things that made Christmas Michigan amazing. I went up there this summer, and what I found is the giant wood thing of Santa was still there, but really Christmas Michigan was more of a suburb of a resort town. There were a lot of strip clubs. There were a lot of things and bars and places for people to go when they're vacationing in that area. And it was no longer the town I remembered. It, like people, get there through a process. And it makes you wonder if Frank Capra saw the same kinds of things going on in his world. And it's not so much that George is seeing a town without George. In fact, George sees the town because there is no George Bailey who is saving these towns and keeping them Bedford Falls instead of turning them into Pottervilles. He suggested that basically... Everywhere is a Potterville now. That seems a little bit harsh. I understand where he's coming from. But what can we do then to keep our towns from becoming Pottervilles? First of all, I think that we have to, again, realize that every life has an impact. We have to look at the fact that every life we touch touches other lives too. (laughs) I think when it comes to George getting married, we have to remember that sometimes we have to take that risk to reach out to other people. The next lesson is that sometimes your childhood dream doesn't come true, but the dream you get is even better than you imagine. Clearly, George was a person who needed a community as much as a community needed him. 
And if he was out there in the world, traveling and seeing all the wonders of the world, he wouldn't have anybody there on his side. Sure, he would meet people along the way, but in Bedford Falls, not only did they have him, but he had them. If you are under a time of great stress, <laughs> watch what you say. He lashes out at his family. Wasn't great. He did apologize, but at every point, every human being needs a little bit of grace and a little bit of forgiveness. As he gave grace and forgiveness to the people who owed him for businesses, when there was a run on the bank, he helped them out. A little bit of grace and forgiveness he gave to them came back to him. The next lesson is that a new story or a way of framing what's going on in your life can make all the difference. Nothing changed in the end of the movie because he had this trip with Clarence about what this town would have been like without George. Nothing changed but George. George had that experience and suddenly... By seeing what had changed, he decided he wanted it all back. Possible jail time, debt, all the problems he had before. He wanted his life back. He wanted Mary and he wanted his kids. And a new story helped him frame that nothing else mattered except for them and his town of Bedford Falls. Having morals and sacrifice for other people is important because if we look out only for ourselves. We only have ourselves when you need looking out for. You're all there to help each other and keep each other going. Your community is important. And so if you don't have a community, then it's time to get one. It takes work. It's a lot like dating where you go out and sometimes you meet a toad and sometimes you meet a prince. But in this case, it's about not romantic love, but building a group of people who have your back. It's important to remember that sometimes good things happen to bad people and they never get punished or have the bad thing happen. Life is sometimes unfair about that. And the opposite is true is sometimes good people have bad things happen to them. You're never going to get that clear course of, I'm a good person, I deserve good things. He's a bad person, he deserves something bad. You just have to remember that life's about hills and valleys and that you're going to have both of them. The important lesson here with the movie is that sometimes things happen quickly. The problem with George is that a bunch of bad things all happened in one night. He just was miserable. He was angry. And he was someone who couldn't see the way around the next corner, probably because everything happened so quickly. Had any one of those things happened in slow motion, probably would have been okay. And I think we have to remember, too, that sometimes bad things in life happen in rapid succession. I always joke that I'm like um, Jerry Seinfeld. In one of his shows, he talked about how he's even Steven. He loses $20, he gains $20. This bad thing happens, well, this good thing happens next. It's nice to think of life being this tit for tat, good versus bad all the time. The reality of it is that isn't how it goes. Sometimes... You are in the slog of bad things, weeks, months, maybe even years. And sometimes you're in good times, weeks, months, and years. And it's important to know that we have to be resilient, not just for the bad days, but for those bad extended times. Be able to parse those things out and always find the wonderful things in there. Life can look really bad. Life can look kind of dim at times. But there's always blessings, life always matters, and your life is always important. Even if you say up to this point is, well, I made all these great impacts in the past, but I don't make any impacts now. We talked about the fact you don't know future you. Future you could change the world and you have no idea. So it's not about just the blessings of today. It's not just about the hard things of today. It's about our future and who we're going to be in the future. I was listening to someone talk about a situation where his son died. And obviously, there's no good in that. You can't see anything beneficial there. And he was destroyed by it. Later, he met someone who had a son who also died. And he realized that he was uniquely qualified to talk to him. You never know where life is going to take you. 
and where those experiences in life are going to bring you. So remember to always make sure that you understand the blessings in things, the gratitude in things, even in our darkest days. The next message is never compare yourself to other people. Part of George's problem is that he looked at his brother, the hero, his friend, the manufacturer who was rich and had all sorts of women hanging all over him, living in a high rise in New York, and Henry Potter himself, the richest man in town, had everything he wanted, on the books at least. If you compare yourself to other people and not look at yourself as the individual person you are, you're going to be unhappy. The next part is keep regrets down. George was filled with regrets because of the image I think he had of what his life was going to be. He saw his father have the savings and loan and all the woe it brought his father, and now he had it on him. He was a man, I think, until that day where he saw what life was like without him, lived in regrets. And remember that it doesn't do you any good. It doesn't help you in any way to have regrets. It's just about moving on from there. In another op-ed on Salon Magazine, it says, quote, Throughout the film, George sees himself as a failure because he never left Bedford Falls, traveled the world, or achieved his dreams. Instead, by staying home, he improved the lives of so many people and in doing so, made friends. In the final scene, these friends showed their gratitude to him for all that he's done for them. I think the important thing to walk away with is George is going to walk out of there knowing how loved he is. Henry Potter, he might always have money. He might always have the biggest house in town, but he's going to know he's alone. Nobody loves him. And when he sees how the town came in for George, he's going to realize everything that he's missing. Some interesting facts about this movie. Because this movie was so long ago, technology came in place because Frank Capra wanted a more realistic type of snow. Before this movie, cornflakes, cereal, was painted white and dumped out of a box. That's what made snowflakes. He didn't want the crunch because when the snowflakes landed, it made a crunchy sound. So Frank Capra had ivory soap flakes, that's soap, shaved into flakes, a few ice chips in there, and fomite, which is related to what's inside of fire extinguishers. He said that when you see that Clarence jumps into the water, some of that water is sudsy, but that's because of the soap. I think it's great. You know, it still looks pretty bad in terms of what real snow looks like. But I think that it's impressive that they tried two new technologies in order to make this movie. Seneca Falls, New York, always claimed that it was a town that Frank Capra had in mind because he visited there in 1945. So they have the museum of It's a Wonderful Life and a festival. There's some other towns out there that will not agree with this statement. In fact, there's a town that's not too far away that says, no, 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 that bridge he jumped over looks just like our bridge. So it kind of goes along with what I was saying last week about the song Imagine. If we didn't have countries and borders, we would fight over which town It's a Wonderful Life was built around. One of the first reviews of the movie was 1947. Someone named Manny Farber wrote, far from being a sweet and sentimental tale, it is a terrifying, asphyxiating story about growing up and relinquishing your dreams, of seeing your father driven to the grave before his time and living among bitter, small-minded people. Whew, I don't know about that. I think the movie is delightful. It's charming. It's heartwarming. Every time I watch it, it brings a tear to my eye because these are people who are there for each other. Not Henry Potter, not the people he hangs out with, but the town of Bedford Falls should remain in us all. And if we feel that life has become too crass, that we don't have a Bedford Falls anymore, if Christmas Michigan is not what we remember it to be, then that means it's up to us to be the George Baileys in order to make the Bedford Falls come back again. Selflessness, sacrifice, and integrity are the keys to that. So my challenge to you is think about the lives you touch. And not just in a light way, but meditate on it for a while. 
Turn off the music. Think about it. If you feel like you don't touch lives, you're not thinking hard enough. You matter, and the actions you take matter. And how can you be the George Bailey of the people around you? All right, everyone, thanks very much. I appreciate you listening. Please have a very happy Christmas, a very happy holidays. And we're going to start talking about getting habits on track at the new year. So please remember, you can be George Bailey and impact the lives of other people by taking small steps.